Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks to Bart and all the other organizers. Um, he includes me in that list. I really do very little. I uh, try to find speakers that I enjoy watching. Um, and this first speaker is definitely one of the favorites uh, that I've seen over the last few years. Um, but Bart and the rest of the organizers put a ton of work into this. Um, all I do is try to find good speakers. And then I go dark for long periods of time, so it makes Bart really nervous. Um, I've been pretty effective at that. But anyways, without further ado, uh, our first speaker is uh, Aaron Tenderlove Patterson. Um, Aaron has been a core contributor to Ruby on Rails since 2009. Uh, I was just looking, he's actually second uh, in number of commits to Ruby on Rails, so got up your game a little bit, Aaron. Um, he is, you know, just generally a, a renaissance man, a sausage maker, a beer brewer, a lover of squishy-faced cats. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what else I can say other than uh, enjoy this first keynote. Aaron Patterson, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, hello, hello. Oh, it's on. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, 8 a.m. Well. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really excited to be here to Path to Agility. Um, I'm really happy that we're all going to get agile, and I know that the way that you actually get agile is through calisthenics. Uh, so this is one of my favorite agile leaders, Richard Simmons. Uh, <laughs> I saw in the program we have about 90 minutes for this talk, so what we're going to do here today is we're going to do uh, 20 minutes of jumping jacks, 20 minutes of push-ups, 20 minutes of sit-ups, and then 30 minutes of development techniques. And I figure that by the time we get through the 20 minutes of sit-ups, we should be agile by then, all right? We'll be done, we'll be done with our path. <laughs> we'll have made it to agile. Um, all right, hello. Hello. So done with the nonsense. <laughs> Sorry, that's only the beginning of the nonsense. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here. It's really exciting to be here in Columbus. Uh, I am really happy to be in the city where Columbus first landed. Uh, that's really cool. <laughs> uh, my name is Aaron Patterson. Uh, if you see me on the internet, like, you might not recognize me here. This is what I look like on the internet. That is my avatar. So if you don't recognize who I am, you might know that photo. I work for a company called Red Hat. Uh, I work for Red Hat. Um, maybe you've heard of them. I'm on the Manage IQ team at Red Hat, and we develop an application for managing clouds. So if you have a cloud, we can manage your cloud. So if you have any clouds. We can do that. Uh, <laughs> I'm on the Ruby core team. I'm also on the Rails core team. Um, this uh, is a thing that I do, I guess. I'm, I'm on both of these teams. I think I'm the only person on both teams. Basically, what it means is I help develop Ruby on Rails, and I also help develop uh, Ruby the language itself. Uh, you can find me on the internet, as I said. My Twitter name is Tenderlove. My GitHub name is Tenderlove. Also, Instagram, same name. And I'm also on Yo as Tender Love. Uh, I'm a short stack engineer. Uh, I don't do full stack, I do short stack. I love pair programming. This is me doing pair programming. You can see there I have a pair doing programming with me. <laughs> this is how I do pair programming. <laughs> uh, as Todd said, I love flat faced cats. This is my cat. His name is Gorbachev Puff Puff Thunder Horse. Uh, I also have another cat. Her name is her name is uh, C Tech Airport YouTube. Uh, this is that is a close up of her, and she loves programming too. This is her programming. Oh, <laughs> uh, I actually actually the reason I have two cats is my wife wanted me to get cats. And the reason she wanted me to get cats is so that I stopped looking at photos of cats on the internet. Um, but that didn't really work out so well. <laughs> now I have cats and look at cats on the internet. <laughs> anyway, uh, I also have a, oh, hold on. Uh, durr, 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 durr. 
dun, 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 dun. Uh, I have a small consulting company, and I was going to do music for it, but I thought this would be, just singing it would be good enough. Um, adequate, this is my consulting company, Adequate. Uh, we do fairly agile consulting. It's pretty agile, just agile enough. Uh, we're, also, we're also huge fans of extreme programming, and we're developing a, a new safety equipment for doing extreme programming. Uh, this is what it looks like. So in case you need to do extreme programming at work, you want to stay safe. Uh, testimonials, like we get a lot of, we have a lot of clients, our testimonials are just things that people are saying about our consulting firm. They're, they're good enough. Um, they accomplish tasks. Uh, we got what we think we paid for, I think. <laughs> we don't regret anything yet. <laughs> 8 a.m., woo! <laughs> So the, uh, the title of this talk is um, Don't Go Chasing Waterfalls, and yes, this is a TLC reference. Uh, <laughs> I'm not actually going to talk about waterfall development at all. I just really wanted to use the name. <laughs> uh, so we have, a, we have, like I said, we have 90 minutes, and I really didn't know what I was going to do on stage for 90 minutes, so I've decided for the first time ever, what I'm going to do is I'm going to... <laughs> I'm going to have, I'm going to filibuster this keynote. <laughs> Pair programming. <laughs> Burn down chart. <laughs> Story point. Backlog. <laughs> Scrum master. <laughs> Kanban. And actually, this an interesting thing, an interesting point about this word is I speak Japanese, and in Japanese this actually means can means can you can do it, and ban means number, uh, so that's what that means. <laughs> I I don't know if you caught this or not, but please don't take anything I say seriously, <laughs> please. <laughs> User story, test driven development. Stand up meeting, stakeholder. OK, I think we can take an intermission now. <sighs> Hold on. 8 a.m. One more minute. Everybody got their coffee? OK. <laughs> so what we're really going to talk about here is we're going to talk about uh, getting started with Ruby. Uh, then we're going to talk about homeopathic code. Uh, then I'm going to talk about how we Agile, and finally I'm going to talk about Agile destroying itself. Now when I say getting started with Ruby, um, I don't mean how you getting started with Ruby, I mean how I getting started with Ruby. And I want to talk about uh, the first serious Ruby program that I wrote. Well, I should put serious in air quotes there. Uh, but it's the first, like, the first Ruby program I wrote that I was, like, I was really writing it to, to actually accomplish a very important task to me. And that, ta that task happened to do with Lord of the Rings. Uh, the <laughs> so I have to explain a little bit of our process, a little bit of our process at work. Back at the time, it was, I think it was around 2003 or so, it was basically when the third Lord of the Rings movie came out. Uh, they're having a special, or they're doing this special thing where like, they're going to show all three movies right after, like one after another. Uh, so like 12 hours of movies. They're going to show the third movie a day early. And that day happened to be on my birthday. Uh, but anyway, so at work, I, at the time, it was back in 2003. I was a Java developer back then. Don't tell any of my Ruby programmer friends this, please. Shh. It's our, our secret, OK? Uh, I was a Java programmer back then. And the way that our development cycle worked is I would, like, I would change some code, and then I would compile the code, uh, and then I would test a change, and then I would keep doing this over and over and over again. I would do this. Unfortunately, the compile step took like 10 minutes. It took a long time, right? So I would sit there and wait for 10 minutes and try you know, do other stuff. And I have a very short attention span, so that 10 minutes I would, like, go to uh, Hacker News of the time, which I guess was slash dot something. Uh, anyway, so movie comes out, back to the movie. Movie comes out, or it's coming out, and I want tickets to this thing. It's my birthday. I'm really excited about it. So 
I really want these tickets. And they started selling them online at, I think, like 10 a.m., so it was the beginning of the workday. And I go to their website, and of course their website is breaking. It's totally breaking. I can't buy the tickets. And I'm like, okay, well, uh, you know, I've got 10 minutes to kill when I'm building, you know, I'm doing this build, so why don't I write a, I'll, I'll write a program to buy the tickets for me. And this, this program is not open source, and you'll understand why in a minute here. Um, so I write this pro start writing this program, and I actually, like, I write this Ruby program to fill out the form and actually put in my credit card number, so it has my credit card number in the program. So this is why it is not open source. Uh, and what it would do is it would just submit that form, right, and try to buy these tickets for me. And unfortunately, um, I knew it was failing, right? Because I would try to submit it online, I'd tr submit it in the browser and I would see it's failing. And I knew what the failure page looked like, but I didn't know what a success page looked like, so I didn't know whether or not the process had really succeeded. So what I did was, you know, during these compile steps, I'd write out the program, and I would just log out, like, okay, if it's different, then, you know, I'll just log a message and retry. So I never had an exit case, right? So maybe you can see where this is going. I, I, <laughs> I keep, w keep going on my work, and I forget about the program. It's running in the background. And I go take a look at the logs, and I look at it, and I'm like, oh, no. Something changed. It's different. So I go through the process on the website. I'm clicking through, you know, clicking through it. I put in my credit card info, and I see the ending page, and I see, I look at the ending page, and it was successful. And I look at the output log of my program, and I see that it had been successful. And I just go, oh, no. Oh, no. So <laughs> I kill the program very quickly. Very quickly, and I'm like, okay, okay. I call up the credit card company. I call up my credit card company, and I was like, <laughs> I get on the phone with the representative, and I ask them this question. I literally ask them, how many times have I charged my card today? <laughs> Which is a really strange question to ask because, you know, shouldn't I know this? It's my credit card. I should know how many times I've charged that card today. And they didn't seem to bat an eye at that at all. They said, oh, yeah, uh, you've charged your card once today. You've only charged it once. And I'm like, okay, all right. And they're like, it was for, I don't know, like 70 bucks or something like that. I'm like, okay. Uh, so then I call up the ticketing agency uh, to see, you know, I'm like, well, I don't have a receipt. I want to know how many tickets I bought. And I call up the ticketing agency, and I ask them, so, you know, how many tickets have I bought? <laughs> and the guy at the ticketing agency is like, well, you bought, you bought two tickets. You bought two tickets. And I was like, oh, OK, that's great. And he's like, but it seems like we've tried to charge your card hundreds of times. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I go, oh, yeah. I just kept hitting refresh on the page the whole time. <laughs> uh, anyway, so yeah, that's why I got the, I, I was able to get these two tickets, and this is the very first like serious Ruby program that I wrote. Uh, and the moral of the story is this is why you should always leave a note. Um, <laughs> for those of you Arrested Development fans. Uh, <laughs> All right, so next we're going to talk about homeopathic code optimizations. You might be saying, Aaron, what is a homeopathic code optimization? And I'm going to tell you exactly what that is. We're going to go into exactly what that is. This is a new technique that we've been working on at Adequate Consulting. Uh, but first, we need to talk about esoteric programming languages. I'm going to talk a little bit, look at a few different esoteric programming languages. These are going to be some hello world, uh, hello world examples in esoteric programming languages that I enjoy. So the first one we're going to see is this is this is called Anti. This is a programming language that just prints out hello world, and you can see it's all written with uh, cards. So this is a this is a program right here. So this is an interesting esoteric programming language. My next, I like this one a lot. I like playing cards, so this is a fun language for me. The next one is called Piet, or Piet, Piet. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but this is a program right here. 
This image is a program. It's a graphical programming language. The way that it works is the interpreter actually walks through the image, and each color is an instruction for the language. So this prints out Hello World. Uh, the next one here, which I'm not going to say the name of, uh, you can Google it. This is, this is the next one, and it only consists of these characters. And it's actually moving a pointer throughout your program, and you can, you can uh, program using these characters. This is Hello World. It prints out Hello World. Now, my final, my favorite final esoteric programming language is one that's called Whitespace. Uh, it consists entirely of tabs and spaces. And I have put the Hello World program here. <laughs> or have I? <laughs> anyway, that, there's the program. It consists of white tabs and spaces, and that's the entire program. It prints out Hello World. OK. So we've looked at a few esoteric programming languages. Now the next question is, what is homeopathy? What is this? Well, I can tell you that it is about diluting stuff, making it smaller. And now the thing is, I was trying to figure out what homeopathy is about, too. So like any good scientist does, I went to Wikipedia. And unfortunately, I found that this Wikipedia page was way too long. I did not want to read it all. So what I did was I right-clicked on it and highlighted all the text. And if you do that in OS X, it brings up this menu, and it says Summarize. So I clicked on that, and then it brought up this dialog, and I was able to summarize it or dilute it into one line. I think that's right, right? Diluting. Now, the important thing here to take away from this dilution is that we need to dilute six times, OK? That's the magic number, six. Just remember this, OK? Six. Now, the other thing to take away from this is the way homeopathy works is the idea that water has memories. OK, so you put stuff into water, and then the water remembers things. It remembers it. So water has memories. Now, when I was reading about this, I kept thinking to myself, OK, if water has memories, water has memories, can white space have memories? Now, the answer is yes, it can. So I'm going to show you this. I'm going to show you this demo that we've been developing here at Adequate Industries. This is a, this is a program here. There's a Fibonacci sequence. Uh, we're calculating a Fibonacci sequence out to the 34th place. There's a Ruby program for calculating it. You can see, yes, go out to 34 places. Now, we run this, and you'll see that it calculates the number. There is the 34th place. Dilute, that is our program for doing the dilution. And you'll see that it's removing characters. Each character has a 10% chance of going away, of being, turn, being turned into white space. And we can actually continue to run that. So we'll run it again. And you'll see there's the number, the number output there. Uh, and we can dilute it again. And you'll see that it keeps getting, like, the characters keep going away, yet the program is still runnable. We're still able to calculate Fibonacci sequence out that far. So we keep, keep going. Characters are going away. Ah. Yes, they keep going away. And I think we'll eventually get to six places. We'll dilute it six times. How many is that? One, two, three, four, five. Yep, six times. OK, six times. So there's, there's our program diluted six times. And it's still runnable. Do I run it? Come on, Aaron. You can do it. Good job. Good job, past me. <laughs> now, I want to show you that I'm not messing with you. This is a true, this is for real. So we're just going to calculate a Fibonacci sequence of 33 to see that the output changed, right? Because I don't want you to think that I'm doing some sort of trick here. This is a, this is a genuine, a genuine optimization, I say here, in the halls of a university. <laughs> so I'll change it to a class. I'm changing it to a class method here. And really, I'm just doing this to show you that I'm not, like, this is actually working. OK, class method, run it again. Good job, me. M make a mistake. 
OK, so we can still calculate it. It doesn't matter if we change the program. It still dilutes it. It still runs it. Uh, yeah. OK. So the question is, you know, how does this work? Right? How does this program work? We saw that the characters were going away, yet the program continued to run. Right? And I'm going to tell you the way that it works is that the VM remembers the code. It remembers it. OK? These are not, this is not white space. These are memories, all right? Memories, it remembers that. Now, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna look at, we're gonna look at another video here where we do, uh, I forgot what we're doing. Probably running this some more times. Ah, yes, so I didn't like the idea of diluting by 10%. Our optimal number is, you know, six times. So I, I let it say, OK, I want to dilute by 50%. That gives each character a 50% chance of being diluted. That has a 100% chance. And you can see that, actually, if you dilute enough times, this just turns into the white space programming language. So it falls back to that. So we can dilute at any, any percent we want to. So you can see 90%, 98%, we have one character. And it continues to run, totally runs. It works great. All right. So I'm sure you're all thinking to yourself, wow, this is really amazing, and I would love to buy this from you. <laughs> but, but wait, let me sell it a little bit more. What are the benefits of this? The benefits. Let's go through the benefits. First off, it's faster. The, a program that's run through homeopathic optimizations is faster. And I can prove this to you because this, this, it's easy to prove to you because no code is faster than no code. Therefore, this is faster, clearly, right? So the more diluted it is, the faster it is. So let's take a look at a few benchmarks, OK? So we'll run it, we're going to run a benchmark here. We'll run this, run this code, and we'll time it. Uh, and you can see that the first time we run it, uh, it takes 1.6 seconds. Uh, and if we run it again, we dilute it. I'm going to dilute it and redirect it to a file, because we don't want to take dilution time into account, because this is scientific. Uh, then we run it again, and you can see that the second time it takes 1.8 seconds, which I guess is slower. Uh, well, it's, it's usually faster. Just trust me, OK? It's, it's usually faster. And the thing is, well, maybe it's not usually faster. It has a 50% chance of being faster. Because either it is faster or it isn't faster. So 50% chance, right? Make sense? OK, good, good. So it's also more maintainable. Our code is clearly more maintainable, because if we get to 100% dilution rate, there's no code to maintain, right? It's, way, it's much more maintainable this way. Less is more. So clearly, this fast code is agile code, right? It's agile, because it's fast. <laughs> By today. <laughs> Come ask me for pricing later. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about the Agile Manifesto. This is an Agile conference. We've been talking about tech stuff. This is an Agile conference. We're going to talk about Agile stuff. And the first thing, the first thing that any speaker needs to do when they're talking to an audience is they need to establish credibility, right? I need to establish credibility with all of you. So the way that I'm going to do that is I want to show you a copy of the original uh, the original Agile Manifesto. This is, a, this is the original Agile Manifesto. And you'll see here, if we zoom in at the very, very bottom, I'm right there. <sighs> I, actually, I actually got removed when uh, <laughs> Dave Thomas saw that I put my, put my <laughs> nickname in there and was not happy about it. So he, he got me kicked out. But that's OK. I don't hold any grudges. It's fine. Whatever. Anyway, so what I want to do is I want to talk about each of the points. We're going to go over each of the points in the Agile Manifesto and talk a little bit about them. Um, yeah, so the first one, the first, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about them and what they mean. The first one is individuals and interactions over processes and tools. And what this means is uh, it's more important for us to be talking to, talking to other people about our development process rather than coming up with strict, rigid processes for the things that we do. It's more important to be talking to our colleagues, talking to our business uh, customers, and talking about the thing that we're actually developing. 
Uh, the next one is working software over comprehensive documentation. And what this is saying is that it's more important for us to lean on uh, working, actual working software than over the way that something is documented to work. It's more important to know like, how this product actually works. We develop the product, we get it working, we value this working software over some documentation about how it's supposed to work. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Typically with normal waterfall development, you're gonna say, oh, I said I wasn't gonna talk about waterfall development, I just mentioned it, crap. Anyway, typical way that you do this is you say like, okay, you have business people who say, we want this thing, and then developers say, no, we're gonna do it this way, and you have this negotiation going back and forth, like arguing over what we're gonna do, and instead what the Agile Manifesto is saying is we need to work together to work towards a common goal, right? We wanna to work towards a common goal so we're collaborating with our customer rather than having some sort of negotiation over the things that we're going to accomplish. And the final one, which I think is most interesting, and we're gonna come back and talk about this later, is uh, responding to change over following a particular plan. So what this is saying is we wanna take, in, as we're doing development, we wanna take into account changes around us. So rather than having like a six month project and focusing on that, you know, a lot of things can happen in that six months, so we need to take that into account as we're developing our application. Right? We need to respond to that change, not just have focused on one particular goal that's set far out. And I want to talk a little bit about this later. Uh, but I also, before we talk about, go into that in more depth, I want to talk about how we Agile at work. So I want to talk about a, li a little bit about our processes, because I, I think they're slightly different and uh, relate to this a little bit. So, like I said earlier, I work, for, I work for Red Hat, which is an open source company, and the application that we develop is actually is open source. Uh, so you can, go, you can go to this URL and check out our code. It's for managing clouds. Like if you have a cloud, a bunch of servers at work, you can go get this and manage your cloud with it, and it's fine. Anyway, yes, this is our open source code. Uh, we have very, very distributed teams. So I am on the West Coast. A lot of the teams on the East Coast, we have people in Australia, Czech Republic, um, other places. I'm not sure where else. We're very distributed. So what this means is we have to have some way of communicating amongst the teams. So the main thing that we use is we, we have to use very low friction communication. So we'll use things like uh, Skype or IRC. We, we rely very heavily on uh, that type of instant messaging type thing. Uh, we also rely really heavily on asynchronous communication, so like uh, email, a lot. Because I mean like, if I, can't, if I can't reach somebody on IRC, I have no idea what time zone they're in, I'll just send an email and they'll get back to me later. So we rely really heavily on uh, mailing lists as well. Uh, the other thing we do is we have, we have a daily stand-up, and I mentioned that we're all, we're all very remote, and the daily stand-up is pretty much optional. I like going to it because I like to see my other teammates once in a while, like actually see their faces once in a while, which is nice. Uh, helps me feel more, I don't know, close to the team. Uh, but you know, it's not for everyone. It's for me, maybe not for everyone. Uh, we, have, we have two week sprints. So we plan what we're gonna do. At the beginning of the sprint, we have a sprint planning meeting where most of the senior engineers get together with the business. Uh, people and we discuss what we're going to be developing over the next two weeks and we track all of those things in a Trello board. So we use Trello uh, and like I said our project is open source so you can go check out our check out our Trello board. It's public there so you can see what we're working on. Um, and I'm not, I keep talking about all this openness that we have. I'm not saying that you need to be open to do agile development processes. Uh, I'm just saying that we do Agile development. If you want to study it, you can feel free to. So we, we store most of our high-level high projects on, in Trello. Uh, and as we're doing development work, anytime we come across some sort of issue with that project, not necessarily a bug, but maybe a new requirement or something, we'll log it in the Trello board as well. We'll just throw it in there. This is kind of our repository for the things that we're working on. Uh, we also use GitHub issues. Uh, this is where we do most of our bug tracking. Any bugs that come in from the community, um, we file here. Or we'll also just file bugs there. Uh, go ahead, take a look at it. And also, we, we also use Bugzilla, but this is not, not so much. 
Um, some bugs come in internally on that, but I'm just mentioning, mentioning it here for completeness, really, but most of our stuff is in GitHub. So at the end of the sprint, we actually do a, we do a sprint review where we meet, and everybody that worked on a feature during that sprint, they come up with a little bit of, like, maybe a slide or two about it, and we put together a slide deck. We talk about our projects, what we accomplished that sprint. We also talk about what worked and what didn't work. And when I say we talk about what worked and what didn't work, we talk about what worked in terms of the project, so in terms of the, the actual feature that we were working on. Uh, and we also talk in terms of the process as well, like, is our process going well? What happened? You know, what did we do? What did we accomplish over the past two weeks? What could we do differently? And one thing that's really important to bring up here is that during these review processes, we don't assign blame to anybody. So if some particular thing was supposed to happen within that two weeks and it didn't finish, we don't say, hey, you're terrible. You're, it's your fault. We look at that and figure out why it didn't work. What, didn't, what happened that, what do we need to do to make sure that this works in the future? So, for example, let's say we have a project, we say we're gonna, we're gonna do this project within the two weeks, and it turns out that the work is just too much to finish in two weeks, right? So, what happens is, during that two-week development process, the person or people working on that, that project will log things into the Trello board saying, hey, I just found out that uh, in order to accomplish this project, we also have to do this thing. We also have to do this and this and this and this, right? And we just get as much done as we can during that two-week process, and at the end of it, we review it, and then we say, well, okay, did it turn out we just weren't, we weren't good at estimating what, had to do, what we had to do for that, that project? Why did we fail at estimating that? Um, do we need to focus on refactoring our code? Is the code just too hard to change? Should we, should we be developing resources to make it easier to change? Uh, all these, we take all these things into account. So what I want to say is we're, we're focusing not just on that development work, but also on the process that we have. It's also very important that we focus on the future. We're not, we're not looking at, uh, we look at what happened in the past, but we say, like, this is what we want to do in the future to get this to work better. So we're not focusing on what happened in the past. We're focusing on how we get to the goal in the future. Now, we actually record all of this stuff. All of these meetings we record and put on YouTube, so you can go watch all of them here, because this is an open source product. And so, yeah, you can go take a look at it there. Uh, please don't, because I'm very shy about listening to myself. Uh, it's very embarrassing to hear myself talk, so don't listen to me talk. <laughs> please. Anyway, so. As I said earlier, we're, we're very open about all this stuff. It's all open source stuff. Um, and you don't have to do this, you know, you don't have to be open about all this stuff, but I'm saying that you can study our processes. You can look at all of our stuff online. If you want to learn from us, you can do it for free. Just go look at all these different links, look at the way we do processes, and you can actually get involved too if you, wanna, if you want to, if you want to try out our stuff and get involved. Uh, and if you don't want to go through all this stuff, you can also buy my book. Only $14.99. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> I'm kidding. There is no book. <laughs> All right. So the way we talk about Agile at work is that we, we try to move quickly. We develop new features. We fix our software. But also, we fix our process. So we don't just refactor our code. We also refactor our process. Our dev process is not concrete. OK? All right. So I want to talk about, the next thing I want to talk about is the Dreyfus model for learning. Uh, the Dreyfus model for skill improvement, this is invented by uh, the Dreyfus brothers at UC Berkeley. Uh, originally, this was used, for, used in the nursing industry, I believe. Uh, and I want to talk about this, this process for skill improvement and then how that relates to agile, agile development. And there's five different stages in this. And we'll talk about each step in the stage. Goes from novice, advanced beginner, all these. At the top is our most basic strategy, or our most basic skill, all the way down to becoming an expert. And we'll talk about what each one of these are and what they mean, and then how this relates to agile development. So a novice, a novice in any particular field has to adhere to a set of rules. So if you're new to something, 
you get a list of rules and you follow all those rules. And I'm sure all of you have experienced this. You, you learn how to do something, you're just learning how to do something, maybe you're learning, you know, you're doing cooking, so you follow all the rules in a particular recipe. You're following that very closely, right? You don't make any decisions on your own, you're following that list. The next stage, you become an advanced beginner. So you understand that in certain situations, there's something you, you need to change, right? You need to do something a little bit differently depending on the situation that you're in. Uh, but you treat all of your aspects, all, all aspects are treated equally. You don't understand how to say this step is more important than this one. You just know that there's different, there's different things you need to do, but you don't necessarily know how, which one is more important than the other. From there, you become competent. When you're competent, you do deliberate planning. You plan, your, you plan what you're going to do deliberately. You create ut routines for those things that you're going to do. You understand your actions, and you understand how those actions relate to the goal that you're trying to achieve. The next stage is becoming proficient. When you're proficient, you have a holistic view of the situation. You understand the whole situation that you're dealing with, and you're able to prioritize those aspects. So you know about all the aspects in that goal you're trying to accomplish, and you're able to tell which one is more important than the other one. And you can prioritize those. You're also able to tell when you're deviating from a normal plan. You know when things are going awry. You're less reliant on rules, but you're still using maxims for guidance. So you don't rely on rules necessarily, but you're still using maxims to understand where you're going. And finally, you become an expert. And experts know what is possible. They know everything that could be done, and they use an analytic approach to new situations. They have no reliance on a fixed set of rules at all. Now, what's interesting about this is that it applies to all skills. So if I become an expert, you know, I, I'm an expert programmer, but maybe not, well, no, I wouldn't say that. I'm not an expert programmer. <laughs> I'm an expert cat petter. <laughs> so this applies to all skills, right? I might be an expert programmer, but I'm not an expert chef. I'm a novice chef. Expert programmer, novice chef, Maybe I'm an advanced beginner uh, house cleaner. I don't know. Something. But these are all, you know, it changes, and it all depends on the skill, and you go through all these stages for all the different skills that you have. Now, what's interesting about this, what's very interesting about this, pro this process is if you start at the beginning here from novice and you go all the way down through expert, you're becoming less and less reliant on a fixed set of skill or on a fixed rule set. You don't need to know rules. As you get further and further to expert, you don't need this rule book anymore, right? As you gain experience, rules become less and less necessary. Okay? So, with that, I want to talk, I want to get to the final section here of my not quite 90 minute. Talk. I don't think we're going to make it to 90 minutes. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about Agile destroying itself. OK? So we, said, we talked about the Agile manifesto earlier. And clearly, I'm an expert in this because I was on the original manifesto, right? The original one, the true one. <laughs> so in the Agile manifesto, the very, last, the very last point is, responding to change over following a plan. And I think this is very, very interesting, especially when you think about it in terms of the Dreyfus model, right? The Dreyfus model says as you become an expert, you don't need to follow a plan, okay? So what is this, what is this line really saying to us? This, to me, it says you must become an expert. So it says in Agile, you need to be an expert. Become an expert. But then I started thinking about this, and I thought, well, okay, I have to become an expert. Uh, I'm reading, you know, I look at this list in the Agile Manifesto. The very last one is become an expert. And then I realize that I'm also following a plan. Agile is a plan. It says you have to follow these steps to be Agile. Or if you go to, like, you go to any sort of Agile training, they'll be like, OK, you follow all these steps and you become an Agile developer. All right? You're now an Agile developer. I have certified you Agile. You are now Agile if you follow this plan. Yet in the manifesto it says we don't follow plans. So the question is, the question I kept thinking about is what happens when we become an expert? What happens when we become an expert at Agile? We have to throw out the plan. 
It has to go away. We don't follow the plan anymore. It doesn't matter anymore because we're experts. I think what the real message here, the real message that this is trying to give us, or the real message that Agile is telling us, is that we need to embrace self-reflection. We need to think about our own processes, think about the things that we're doing. We need to think for ourselves. This is what it's really saying. Saying, look at these, start out with these rules, start out with these, but as you become more and more of an expert in this list of rules, don't follow them anymore. You shouldn't be afraid to change these rules. So go take Agile training, learn about the Agile software methodology, you know, learn all the things you can, but remember, you know, as you, get more, as you get more and more experience with it, you need to throw it out later. You need to become an expert at this thing. Don't stick to that rule book for the next 10 years. Don't be afraid to change those rules. And that's all I have. Thank you. My wife and I. <laughs> All right, thanks.